Good evening and welcome to the May meeting of Melbourne PC User Group, aka Melbourne Computer Club. We've got a little bit of something special in store for you now. Um, I have a, a very uh, high, high profile panel waiting here to discuss what's it going to be like after the coronavirus passes. So we're going to be doing that for about an hour, um, as long as I can keep it all in check. I've never done this thing before. Uh, and then we'll go on and do a couple of the traditional things like the uh, President's Report, which will be Australia again, and a little bit of a what's new from George Scarbeck. So let me now introduce to you our panel, and I'm just going to go from top to bottom on my screen here. We have John Blackburn. Um, John, hopefully you can see his face now. Uh, John is a retired Air Force officer. He was 2IC of the Royal Air Force. Um, and he now concerns himself and is an advisor to government on all matters of national security and um, supply chain reliability. Is that about right, John? Finn, uh, national resilience is what my favorite. Thank you. National resilience. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on my screen, we have Sean Whitaker, who works for Australia Post. Uh, he's emphasised that he's not here to represent Australia Post at the moment, so the views he expresses are his, home, his own. I doubt if they'll be terribly controversial, but he's got a lot of knowledge and information and experience with making large, complex systems continue to function in the face of adversity, both with APO and with a couple of major banks before that. Uh, next, we have James Jansen. James Jansen uh, is the founder of what became the Science Party, for one thing, but he's here mainly in his um, capacity as being a computer modeler who has been modeling pandemics. In fact, he did his PhD on computer models of pandemics. Uh, I came across James on one of these YouTube clips, which basically was saying, hey, guys, they're using the wrong kinds of models for this thing, and they should be using agent-based models, not, um, what, was the, what, was, what was the word, James, that they used? Um, they're, they're using compartmental models. Compartmental models, yes. Yeah. Um, and basically, I, I, I can, I sort of, it, that resonated with me because I've done a little bit of modeling using both, I guess, both methods, but most recently, uh, what he calls agent-based modeling. I did nothing but with um, pandemics. I was modeling cows in a paddock, but the same principles apply. Um, next, we have Jessica McPherson, uh, one of our better imports from New Zealand, I dare say. Uh, and Jessie is the founder and the person who runs St Kilda Mums, which is a local charity. Uh, we support a little bit, the club has supported a little bit. Um, whose mission in life is to assist, I think, primarily single mums who are down on their luck and can't even find money for, for baby food and for cots and prams and things like that. Have I got you about right there, Jessie? Uh, finally... Yes, but you, sorry, you forgot one important thing. Yes. <laughs> that we recycle, we recycle second-hand goods. They recycle so saving things from the landfill. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So Hugh, you're <laughs> the one with the baby. When your uh, cots get too big for the, or well, the baby gets too big for the cots, probably, and the primes and the strollers, you know exactly where to take them because by then Jesse's warehouse in Clayton is going to be open again, isn't it? And is that everyone? Because the the arrange order of the pictures on my screen has rearranged itself. So anyone I haven't mentioned. Speak now, Anthony. That would be Anthony. Oh, oh, Anthony. Okay. Now, Anthony actually was the inspiration of this whole thing. I came across an article of his in the uh, Conversation, which is an excellent online um, publication. It's objective, it's brainy, it's intellectual, and it's factual. Uh, and he had written a, a piece there. Geez, I've forgotten exactly what it was about. But it was certainly around resilience and, and social change brought about by these sorts of traumas ranging what from bushfires to earthquakes to the old virus here and there. So that's Anthony and he's been very supportive in this um, process of, um, have we got the right Anthony Richardson there on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. 
Just, oh, that's a, just trying to get the mic to work. So yes, that's you've got the right one. Oh yeah, we had a Sean Whitaker there, I think, or something. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused now. I'm, yeah, here, there you go. I, all these good people, I've, most of them I've only met in the last few days. I think, with the exception of, of Jesse, we've had a couple of get their meetings in the past. So without further ado, I'm now going to try and put my Tony Jones hat on here. I hope you all appreciate my 3D printed tie, by the way. Um, and start getting on to some get this discussion underway. Uh, we have some questions from uh, members of the club, and I think I'll kick off with one from Maureen Garwood. And her question is actually to James, James, James Jensen. Um, based on your modeling experience, what pattern is COVID-19 going to take? And when the borders open, is there an expected surge in numbers contracting the virus? And when, based on your experience, is it going to end? Please see the attached 1918 pandemic graph um, com to compare with. So oh, yeah. this is where I have to share my graph, isn't it? It's, so, it's the, um, the deaths per thousand persons and the uh, second wave is quite a bit higher than the first wave. Um, so uh, yeah, for those who don't know, the, the Spanish flu, um, which didn't really come out of Spain, it actually came out of likely North America, um, but uh, it was supposed to be prevalent in Spain, but it was actually um, quite prevalent in Northern Europe, but because of various national security requirements on the newspapers, they weren't really allowed to report on it. So they could use, um, you know, a pseudonym for it being, you know, the North European flu. They could call it the uh, Spanish flu instead um, to get around that at the time. So quite an interesting pandemic. Um, I, I'm not sure about um, how close this will be. I, I mean, I've, I gave a, per, a uh, presentation which uh, talked about the worst case scenario and the worst case scenario could be that um, no one gets immunity from COVID or we don't come up with a uh, vaccine uh, and this becomes a cyclical year after year infection that evolves. And that's certainly a possibility um, with potentially billions of people being infected by this thing. There are a lot of hosts which can, uh, you know, be a place for those, you know, viruses to to mutate and then, you know, evade people's existing immunity. Um, so it, it could end up being that way. At the moment, it looks like the virus doesn't evolve as quickly as things like influenza, but I definitely wouldn't rule out, um, you know, this becoming a, a yearly uh, pandemic. And I think that we should prepare for it just in case one way or the other. Um, in terms of uh, how this relates to border closures, I actually think that we're going to have ongoing border closures um, for a very, very long time. I, I think that we aren't going to be able to, to lift uh, international travel without some sort of quarantining me measure, especially while we have such a low prevalence in this country. So North America, um, we could be getting up towards, you know, 10% of people infected potentially. It, it's very hard to tell because we're not actually doing enough tests to work out how many people actually have the infection. So we don't know if there's sufficient people infected that we can just, you know, open the doors and go about our lives normally. Um, so there's that has to come first. And, you know, they're developing things like um, serological tests that can be used to, to detect antibodies to work out how many people have had it in the past. In terms of international travel, um, I actually, I mean, I haven't done any modeling specifically on the uh, infection coming into Australia. Um, you know, if we lift the borders, I actually think that the biggest risk in the short term is the fact that we are starting to lift our restrictions right now and we actually haven't worked out um what uh like whether we've cleared it or not um we've come very close to actually completely eliminating 
uh, COVID from places. And it looks like it's happened in, in um, the Northern Territory and South Australia, but we really haven't cleared it um, convincingly in Victoria and New South Wales. So we have that massive outbreak in the Victorian um, meat packing factory. And that looks like it's, I think it's in excess of 40 cases now that are linked to that, just one outbreak. Um, and we've got five new cases in New South Wales of unknown origin, which is a bit of a shock because it's actually been a few days where we've had no cases from unknown origin. So I actually think that that is the biggest um, risk to our society right now. I think as long as this thing is a global pandemic, we're going to have continued quarantines in Australia. But the, the biggest short term risk is lifting those restrictions. Yep. Okay. So it could get worse. It depends on how we play the game going forward, I guess, is the, the short form version of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. We have a question from John Hall here, um, directed to the panel. So we'll get somebody to volunteer to take it. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and the question from John Hall is, can China afford to impose trade sanctions on us? If we continue to inquire about the source of the virus, and should we be restricting imports from China to, to prevent them from threatening us in future? That sounds kind of like a John Blackburn question, I think. So John, would you like to have a go at that one? Thank you for that one. Uh, look, there's a lot of debate in public about this at the moment. The, the fundamental thing we've got to look at is not just react to threats. What the government's currently doing about saying we have our sovereign interests and we have to maintain that sovereignty is prime in this. If we cede control of what we do to a foreign government, then we've lost sovereignty. So the next thing to have a think about with this whole trade issue with China is, yes, we should push for an independent inquiry rather than listening to what's coming out of the US government at the moment. And the next thing is we need to have a look at our international import dependencies. For example, with medicines, we import 90% of our medicines. We don't have any control over those supply chains and we don't have any proper visibility. So we're going to have to go through and work out what it is important for us in Australia to be able to produce ourselves or have a degree of control over. We're calling that smart sovereignty. And of course, we'll be part of a global trading system. But with those supply chains, we need trusted supply chains. So they need to be transparent and verifiable for key imports that are necessary for our society to operate. So when you look at the Chinese issue as a whole, what you'd have to say is that certainly in the case of medicines, the supply chains which China is a part of in that area are neither transparent nor verifiable. So we're going to have some very difficult discussions way beyond whether or not we should have an inquiry into what is the nature of our trading relationships and what do we have to have in Australia as a percentage of our capability that's important to keep our society functioning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me see. I'm going to take a qu another question for John, actually, from Stuart Grunnickley, who is uh, a member. Uh, due to the influence of the pandemic, in your opinion, what significant changes, if any, should be made to Australian defence policy? The most important thing is that we don't have a national security strategy. So right now, Everything that we do in the country is in stovepipe policies or pieces. And the Defence White Paper, published in 2016, was actually written in 2015. It's five years out of date. The world's changed a lot. But we can't expect defence to produce its own policy if there's not a framework around it. A national security policy is important. And that's not about terrorism and military by itself. It's about everything in our country. Perhaps it would be better called a national sovereignty strategy so we can work out what's important. Once that's in place, then you need to look at the defence piece. What is missing from our defence area, and it's pretty important, is that with only 55,000 or so people in the military, defence sits within and on top of our society. So it can't function without the supply chains and supporting industries, supporting workforce and everything else in our society that makes our society work. And that analysis of how dependent it is upon it and what we have to do to make sure those supply chains are robust has not been done. Mm. So there needs to be a fundamental shift. And also this idea that you'll say 2% of GDP goes to defence is mad. I mean, it's a crazy measure. We should be saying what output, what result we want, because our GDP is going to go down 
two percent will keep going down and people are now arguing for three percent on what basis so mm. we need a very serious rethink mm. thank you uh, and we're relying on domestic flights and yet half of those are grounded so uh, we're having to um, charter additional flights to, to every day just to move the product around the country and that's driving the costs right up so um, so there, there are a lot of the challenges that we've got and then we'll be facing into the challenges soon of um, how do we start to integrate some of our workforce um, back into the office type locations we have been maintaining a lot of people um, you know in our um, you know around the country in, in our, our sorting facilities and um, those you know we've had to put in new um, new processes things like you know checking people's temperatures, you know, some capability around contact tracing if, if we needed to do so, um, but also, you know, with social distancing measures. And it's interesting how some social distancing measures, um, if you think about how uh, we might need, you know, because of occupational health and safety, if something's over a certain amount of weight, you might need two people to pick that up. Um, so then they can't stay six feet away from each other. So uh, there's been quite a lot of challenges to get through. And what does this mean in the future? Um, we're, we're still looking at um, how long we're going to be sustaining this kind of volume and whether it's and what that new normal might look like. We're still trying to assess that. It, a lot depends on, you know, wh when we go back to, um, you know, what we could call normal and you know, when we start to release people back into the um, um, back into the, uh, the office environment, but even that's going to change. So the office environments that, w of, that we're looking at implementing is going to be um, probably radically different to how it was in the past. So um, we've seen over years and years and years we've been, um, I guess, you know, squeezing more and more people in. And I don't just mean um, at post, but a lot of corporate, um, a lot of the corporations I've been working at, we've been squeezing people in into smaller and smaller space from a, um, an office location. You know, you went from having your own office to sharing an office to cubicles to um, hot, now, nowadays it's hot desking on desks with they're about one and a half meters wide. So what it's going to look like when we move back is probably removing every second chair. And, and, and so what we see is going to happen is there'll be less than 50% probably of the workforce coming back at any one time because we won't be able to fit them in the building with all the social distancing. So that's going to probably uh, necess necessitate more work from home, I guess, Sean. Yes, um, I think working from home um, is going to be a um, um, in for the you know it'll be a long term thing. I think a lot of roles will probably become permanently work from home, and um, and we may in the short term anyway. We're planning on potentially um, one week working from home, one week in the office, and and sort of trying to segregate the workforce. So looking at all sorts of things like that, and uh, I know a lot of that sort of stuff's being talked about in by various companies. A lot of uh, there was a, a study in the US. Uh, they uh, interviewed some CFOs over there, and and about sixty percent of the CFOs said they'd probably see uh, less than fifty percent of the workforce actually come back into an office type environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, on, on that uh, issue about the capacity, um, did you see it being a big spike and now it's like waning a bit? Or do you think that it's um, like maintaining at a high level? And do you think that this is like a, a prelude to people actually doing a lot more online um, purchasing? Yeah, good, good question. Um, it has been quite sustained and in fact, um, has been steadily increasing very slightly. So it was a sudden impact and very high sustained. This, we're talking about the sort of uh, volumes we see sort of start around the um, uh, the, the Black Friday, Cyber Monday period, just you know, in, in November, just before Christmas. And that and, and you sustain that kind of volume until um, until Christmas, and then things start to um, to go back to normal. And right now we don't know when this is going to end. We just don't know. Um, what, I, looking at this is it, it could be something like people start to run out of money or maybe if everyone's bought their home gym they don't need to keep buying these things um, maybe you know as we start to um, let people out and, and we go back to work maybe we'll see some of these volumes drop we have seen um, but we, we could also you know hopefully take um, some comfort that potentially you know we've got a lot of lot, a lot of new customers and hopefully we, we might keep those customers. I think maybe some people who might 
not have previously enjoyed the online shopping experience or, or, or ever ventured there may be doing it through necessity now and saying, actually, this is not so bad. I think I might continue to do that. So I think um, the biggest thing we're looking at at the moment is what, what do we think this might look like in the future? So, um, and look, we're not sure what's going to happen with, uh, you know, so the warehouses, right? So the people who are distributing these things from their warehouses, how are they getting restocked? Where is, is that stock coming in from China right now? Probably, probably not, or in a very small volume. So potentially is, is that going to run out? Um, and do we then see a lot of things on back order and then we see, might see a drop? So um, who knows? The one thing we do know is that it's, um, you know, we, we what we understood to be very, um, very is easy to uh, predict um, growth curves that we've been using for a long time um, are, uh, you know, obviously, obviously they're um, they're not reflecting what's going on right now. So we've had this, and I'm going to use the term disruption, but we've had this disruption come in, and um, and and I think you know it's not just within the area I'm working at, but all businesses are seeing this disruption now, right? A lot of the time in technology, we talk about digital disruption, but this is an actual real, um, you know, this is a pandemic dis disruption. Um, so it's, it's on a completely different scale and it's impacting everything. So I think it's what's, what's the economy going to look like? You know, what's the, what's the, how's the country going to work as a system? You know, is, it this, is this whole thing is this, was a well-oiled machine. What does this well-oiled machine look like with all these different parts now? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to sort of get on to a bit more on the social thing and bring in Jessica McPherson here. Um, one of the things that, that struck me fairly early in this piece, Jesse, was that on Facebook you saw people, you know, sort of people doing all these kind of neighbor friendly things. I've got a teddy bear out the front on my gate post and we had the little girl next door painting rainbows on a driveway and, and it was lovely just walking around the streets. Uh, just seeing family groups out there on their bikes and what have you. And that's a, a kind of a thing, a, a feeling that, that we haven't had before in quite the same way. So do you, sort of coming from that, I'm hoping, in fact, that there's going to be some changes in our underlying assumptions, if you like, about how our society works and how we, we, we regard each other. So do you think that this increased public awareness of people, especially people doing it tough, who are your your clientele, do you think that's going to have a lasting effect on community attitudes towards dis the, the disadvantaged people in our society? Um, <clears throat> actually, no, I don't. Uh, women are adversely affected by the pandemic. Women are employed in in caring for people, in nursing. In working in old folks home women are employed as teachers women are employed in in part-time and casual work because they look for flexibility and um, that allows them to care for their children their families um, and what we're seeing is that there's a disproportionate number of women who are being uh, stood down made redundant um, have lost their work women are women are being really adversely affected by the situation and where women are the sole carer the sole parent um one in six um uh, families in australia is a single parent family headed by a mother um you know the 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 the, pro the problems are really compounding women in these jobs um, that they're being made redundant from or losing their work from they don't earn a lot of money. They don't have huge reserves. They don't have um, superannuation. They don't have savings. They don't have assets and property that they can draw on. Um, and then of course, uh, money concerns in, in families where, where, um, uh, where, there's, where there's stress about money, there's often uh, concerns about family violence and women who perhaps haven't experienced um, violence or abuse um, before are experiencing violence and abuse for the first time. And for us, it's, a, it's an absolute perfect storm because um, a lot of women experience violence and abuse for the very first time in their, during their pregnancy and when they are nursing a new baby. So it's, it's all of these factors combining that are making life very, very dangerous for women. And we, we have seen, um, you know, on average, a woman is murdered 
by someone she knows every week in Australia. And that's it's it's been reported that there's been a 20% increase in, in incidences of abuse and violence, um, family violence. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't think we're doing enough. I don't think it's fair. Um, yeah, and I and I think it's wonderful that people are putting teddy bears in their windows, but that's doing nothing to help women who have lost their job. And I spoke to a woman just today who um, actually incredibly generously made a two thousand dollar donation to St Kilda Mums. I, I called her to say thank you, and I asked her her reason for the donation, and she told me that she was on maternity leave, she was at home with a newborn baby, and she'd just lost a job and been paid out her redundancy, and she decided that. She, you know, she said her words, it's been a really shit day, but the only thing that's made me feel good today was knowing that I was paying it forward for someone else. So that's what's happening in Australia right now. Mm. Sad story and a lovely story, Jessie. Uh, do you think You're government welcome. should be, do you think government should be taking on more responsibility for the disadvantage? And would you support a universal basic income? I do support a universal basic, basic income. Uh, one of the really sad things about JobKeeper is that it has excluded so many casual workers who haven't been employed for more than 12 months. Um, it excludes uh, people who are on certain visa types, asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, Kiwis like myself. I've been here for 20 years, so I, I, I'm not one of them, but I am a Kiwi and it upsets me that there are, there are groups of people in our society who are excluded from Medicare, from Centrelink payments, from JobKeeper. Um, and it's the place of charities like the one that I work for to provide for those families, because if we didn't, um, no one else would. Can I just add something to that, if, if that's okay, David? Yes, oh. yes, yes. Yeah, just um, uh, I'm a supporter of um, the universal basic income as well. And um, the point I would make is if you look at what's happening in America with some of the protests against the lockdown, um, I think there's a little bit of asteroid turfing going on there. There are some pretty, um, these, these protests are being put forward by people with other agendas. But there's also a really understandable amount of distress in a country like America because people aren't getting any help. So you're telling people you can't go to work, you have to stay home. And there's no unemployment. I mean, that stories we've heard of the the um, the unemployment checks being held up so President Trump could put his signature on them. Yeah. Um, but the difference between what's happening in in, um, in Europe, Northern Europe, with their rather strong um, support network, and in America with a very basic support network, is pretty instructive. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You've mentioned Northern Europe and and. As uh, some of you know, my my roots are back in, partly at least, in Norway. And, you know, I haven't even thought to ask the question, what are Norway doing about those sorts of things at the moment? Because I'm sure they're doing the right thing. And just, <laughs> it's a given. And, and um, yeah, that's, a, a, I, no, the, the, the American situation is, is just American. <laughs> what can you say? Um, Thank you for that, uh, Jesse. Um, Anthony, well, we've got you there. Um, Qantas just announced that it's pausing their A380 upgrades. And in fact, their whole international fleet is under review. They're mothballing planes, both Qantas and internationally mm -hmm. allowed are mothballing planes in the outback. Do you think that the international travel market is ever going to um, uh, come back again? Uh, what do you expect the to look like uh, medium to long term, both leisure and business? Look, um, I know from the university where I'm working, we've already shifted rather drastically towards teleconferencing. Um, international conferences are already being shifted to teleconferencing. Um, part of part of what, what happens is, and, and I'll refer to what James was talking about, about... Um, I mean, you look at this as a, as a system, we're, we're talking about having, you know, like New Zealand's done quite well and the possibility of having travel between Australia and New Zealand, reciprocal sort of travel arrangements. Yep. I can't see it returning. I mean, I'm not an expert on international travel, but if we are in a situation where we're deliberately breaking network connections to stop the spread of a virus, 
we're not going to be in any hurry to start transmitting the virus through plane travel again. So I can't see it coming back anytime soon. Um, I've been looking a lot at New Zealand mountain biking videos, you'll be happy to know, Jess, um, because I think that's where I'm going to be travelling at some point. Um, I think that'll be where travel is. It will be, we may well have a regional travel arrangement where certain countries that have managed to reduce the virus or control the virus will allow travel between their borders. Um, and I think a place like America and possibly what's going to happen in South Africa, um, South America or Africa, will make them hotspots. I don't think we'll be flying to um, uh, America at least for a couple of years at this rate. So, um, and the, the other side to this, of course, is, is, is people's, um, people's attitude towards this. People want to go back to normal. Um, so there is, you, you shouldn't, um, that's probably a countervailing sort of trend. People want to return to normal. Um, and as, you know, I don't know what normal is really at this point, um, but I, I can't see it happening anytime soon. I really can't. When it comes to international travel though, I mean, it's only a relatively recent occurrence that people would say, oh, I'm going to fly from Australia to Europe for like a week and a half. And I think that um, if we change our idea about what we do in terms of travel, if we instead of going somewhere every year, um, we say every couple of years or every three years, you go for two or three times as long, mm -hmm. that could potentially offset the time that you might have to spend in quarantine. So it ends up being a six week week trip to Europe and you get to see everything and there's less carbon impact. Um, so I, I still think that there's promise. I actually think that what is going to happen um, based on, you know, mm. centuries and centuries of experience as, as a human race is that we adapt. Um, yes, there's going to be things that come and interfere with what we're doing but ultimately you know we'll find ways to continue to have fun and i doubt very much we're going to end the um 21st century um being stuck in our own little bubbles i think that at some point it will come back how quickly it will come back and what form it will take will be um you know depend on how quickly we, we get a vaccine and what different countries do in terms of their lockdown and, and um, quarantine procedure. Do we, uh, I'll make this an open question, I think. Uh, do, who, do, do we think that this could actually be the death knell for fossil fuels? I'll have a go at that. No. <laughs> uh, look, the reality is we're in an energy transition path and we're going to a hybrid energy system. It is going to take time. People like Vakla Smil, who've written a lot about energy systems, uh, are saying you're talking 30, 40 years for, for a large scale energy transition. The problem for us in doing that is that um, is the economy. There's $57 trillion worth of fossil fuel infrastructure in the world, if you include you know, the aircraft and ships and everything else. Um, we are in what's staggered to depression times and getting out the back end with an economy that's going to stagger for quite a while is going to give us a problem. So that transition of the energy system to a greater amount of renewables will take quite a lot of time and will take a lot of investment in it. So we are with fossil fuels. Where our risk is, and this is a discussion we've been having recently with some people in government, if we lose our fossil fuel industry, we only have four refineries. They're old, small, or well, one that's really new. They're not economic to run at scale. If we lose that, we're going to go from 90% fuel and oil imports to 100%. If we are 100% importing refined fuels from Asian refineries, our resilience goes out the window. We are now completely subject to foreign government control of energy supply. So we've got one problem is how do we keep an out of date uneconomical refining system going? What does our energy transition roadmap look like? Because we do have to phase out of fossil fuels. Uh, there is no energy policy. There is no climate policy and there's no transition plan. So I think we're going to stagger from sort of point to point as we try and get through the back end of this, deal with the economic problem, and then have to deal because of emissions and also energy transition with a highly complex problem which neither major party in our political system has addressed in the last decade. So just on that economics point, um, I, I think that 
one of the things that's been pushing our transformation so far has been that um, solar energy has becoming and, and wind energy has been increasingly uh, cheap to deploy. It's actually getting to a point where it's competitive with existing coal infrastructure in terms of new deployments. And with the price of energy and fuel going down so much, that's no longer as competitive as it was a few months ago. So we're going to be stuck with existing infrastructure not being updated um, because suddenly fossil fuels are much more competitive than uh, renewables again, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but that's ultimately down to reduced demand. So, you know, we're using less energy at the moment. Um, so, yeah, interesting economic effect there. But the yeah. problem we're going to run into is that at the current price, uh, the Saudi oil fields aren't, profit, uh, aren't functional. Mm -hmm. They're $65 a barrel, otherwise they don't function. So if their prices don't come back up for them, then what we're going to see is social dislocation, huge stability problems in the Middle East. Uh, so it's a real trade-off game. And the other problem is, is that while solar and wind um, are per unit energy cheaper, the issue is we have to look at a total system cost because you've got system stability. And the analysis coming out of Europe last year on saying that when you look at the percentage of renewables, if you add the total energy cost up, including stability, a whole degree of hopefully stored pumped hydro, but a whole range of stability issues, then your energy return on investment for the whole system goes from where it is today at 12 to probably somewhere around about eight if you go between 50 and 75% renewables. So it's not the unit cost, it's the total system cost and the cost of transition to it in a world where the economy is just staggering. So I think we're going to just muddle along with these existing pieces uh, because, again, on an emissions basis, when we start to do emissions again, we can't live with that either. What I will let's add to that. Um, one of the points about these low cost of fuels, as John was saying about the um, um, what you need to actually break even. So if you look at some of the things like fracking and shale oil, it takes a certain energy price to break even. So when you talk about, you know, peak oil, it's probably better to talk about what they call a bumpy plateau where you will find the energy. What, what's happening now is, of course, Houston and the US oil industry is shedding jobs. They're shedding them left, right and centre. So at some point, the supply is going to drop when the economy does start to turn around again. We're not going to have enough oil fields and supply up and running. So we'll end up doing this. So I'm not so sure we're at the end of even $100 oil at some point in the future. I think we'll go back to that. But it'll be a chaotic situation because if you haven't got a strategy and plan, all you're doing is continually reacting to these variations. And how can business plan and invest in that sort of environment. So this is where leaving it all to the free market, the neoliberal stuff is not gonna work for us. We can't go back to the capitalist model we had, that's gone. We're not returning to something, we're going to something new. Uh, that requires leadership. And again, that's what's been fundamentally missing at the political strata in our country for a decade, as both parties have internal factional fights and stab each other in the back. Um, this is why this the collaboration we're seeing now through this crisis federal and state governments is a really promising sign and where the ACTU cooperating with government and industry talking we have to keep that collaboration going that cooperation because the only way we're going to survive as a nation at the back end of this is to actually work in a very different way as a team that's going to be what we as individuals and community and voters need to demand of our political system and not, not return to the political games that we've been watching and the ridiculous stuff we're seeing between a couple of politicians in New South Wales at the moment. That's no longer acceptable, but we have to say that. I, I oh, sorry, I, I sort of had this this reaction to that on my mind. So, John, it's it almost sounds as if what you're saying is that your hope for the most profound outcome of this whole thing is that the pollies are going to get their bloody act together at last. And start pulling in the in the in the more or less in the same direction. Uh, no, my profound hope is that Australians will stop being quiet Australians. I know the Prime Minister loves that. <laughs> we have to stop being quiet Australians because it is we as voters, in being complacent, have allowed the political system to devolve to the mess it's in. Now it's our problem. The politicians react and play the game that the public allows them to do. So I put the onus on us in the community to say enough. We're not going to accept this juvenile behaviour. You've got to take a longer term focus and we have to have bipartisan agreement on key things. 
we, we say, oh, we've got you know, bipartisan agreement on defence. Yeah, okay, that's a small part of it. But we need that on climate policy and an energy policy and economic policy because we don't have that. And you can't just stagger on because, remember, we went into this pandemic with the first or second highest private debt in the world. This country economically was nowhere near the strength we had prior to the GFC. And we were strong then thanks to the Keating, Howard and Hawke governments taking some very important steps with the economic system, some brave steps. Since that date, we haven't had brave economic policies, and yet this is the time we need it. So this thing about returning to international travel, if we face the reality of our debt levels, you're not going to go to Bali every year. Life will cost us more because if you want resilience, you have to invest in your community in those issues of people who are suffering. We have to invest in the resilience of our supply chains. That will all cost us more. So we ain't going to go back to the Bali holiday every year if we're sensible. Otherwise, we will leave debt for multiple generations. And that's completely unfair because they're already inheriting a mess from, from you know, the boomers anyway. I, th I think that our welfare situation is, um, I think it's going to be hard to wind back if they, you know, as things start to return, um, there are still going to be a lot of people who are unemployed. And I think that uh, thankfully we've got a little bit of humanity back into our society in thinking like, oh, you know, people who are on payments for whatever reason, it's not just because they're, they're lazy. Um, it's actually because they're in hardship and, Finally, as a society, we've realized that, that there's people who are having hardship when it suddenly can happen to you. Everyone's realizing, oh, this thing called wealth, it's a little bit fragile. It, you know, it comes, it goes. Um, so I actually think that, um, you know, like John was saying, it, we're moving to a different system. Like it's not, it's not that we're moving away from capitalism per se. It's that we're, we're moving to a different type of capitalism where uh, there's a greater demand on things like healthcare, on things like welfare, um, and we are going to have to pay for that. We can't just like print money forever. So there, there will be a higher tax burden associated with that as long as the Australian public demands that. Mm. Can know. I just add, add to that, James, and, and to what John was saying, and this is one of the things that I find really interesting when you look at, you know, John's talking about resilience and so Sean and and. Jess is as well, I think, in a way. Um, but actually resilience is an inverse um, relationship with efficiency. Resilience costs money. You've got to have redundancy. You've got to have the supplies sitting there, whether it's an oil refinery that's a few cents more a litre expensive than Singapore's refinery or whatever that is. We also need to be able to willing to pay that cost. So, you know, our politicians aren't going to do this if we're going to whinge that it's going to cost us 20 cents more at the pump um, or it's going to cost us more in tax to make sure that people have health care. We've got to actually accept that we've been running a system based on efficiency for a long time and it's fragile. And it's Is this a failure us. of leadership? Is it a failure of the, we don't have a Winston Churchill to stand up and say, I can promise you nothing but blood, sweat and tears? I, th I think it's a, um, it's a function of the, capitalist system that we have right so it we're, when companies are in competition with each other it's a competition or it's a race to the bottom in terms of of cost and efficiency so you get um you know we've got just in time um you know supply chains and things like that so that's the resiliency that we're missing and when we design a um an, a, a computer system to be highly available you've got we used to um, you know, measure this in terms of availability of nines, you know, 99% availability, 99.9, 99.99. For every nine that you add, when you get from 99.9 .9 to, to 0.99, you add another zero to the bill when it comes to actually building this thing. That was kind of the rule of thumb we used to always work with. So it does come at a cost and it can come at a, at a great cost. Now, you know, I've designed um, these kinds of systems in, in the banking system that keeps our payment systems going, that, you know, for uh, interbank transfers in the middle of the night. And if these things go down, there's quite a big impact to the economy. Um, so <laughs> if uh, if we left it up to the to the banks, though, to actually, you know, um, to design these systems for themselves without, because 
the reason why they've got this high availability there is because they're, they're actually mandated by the government. So we've got regulation involved here to say this system must be up. So the government said, this is really important to us, right? The economy must run. So therefore you must have this level of availability on these systems. So it's, it's, it's regulated. Now, we probably need to be regulating in the same way in other areas. I think we just haven't in our mindset seen that these other areas are just as important. I think the focus you, is on the economy. I'll give you an example. In Finland, they mandate that you'll hold between three and 10 months of medicine stocks, depending on what the medicine is, for 1,457 medicines. In Australia, we mandate nothing at all. Let the industry do it. We actually yep. don't know what the stocks are in our supply chain until they go short. In April, we had 560 medicines on the shortage list, 70 of which were critical shortages of medicines. In Finland, they stock uh, fuel. They charge two cents a litre. Uh, that gives them the overhead to carry it. They stock food like grains and other things. OK, they've got Russia sitting next door to them. But if Scandinavian countries take this approach because they know that survival of the community depends upon a different model and you must be prepared to do it, We've got to get off this addiction we've got from, you know, sort of we'll just buy whatever we want because you can get it online and we'll just grow debt up and we'll let industry take care of everything. There are good examples of countries that do this very well. How do we change Australia to, how do we change the Australian voter to vote for more? At the end of the day, it's I'm prepared to pay more tax to make these things happen. Simple. In, in, in Norway, they have a social contract. We have a conversation with the Australian public. We change the language. In other words, so we have a discussion. We treat them like adults and we stop this moronic discussion that comes out from the political level. That isn't that good. Now, how good is that? Or I'm going to the footy. <laughs> we need to have an honest discussion because Australians aren't stupid. They're just not well informed. And, and the, and the time's good. never been better than now to have that kind of discussion with the population. So the a lot of groups have been doing what we do with our institute and others have been saying, unfortunately, we're going to need a crisis before we can have a conversation. Well, guess what, folks? We've got the crisis. Well, you know, I'm going to fess up. I'm, I'm afraid this is going to end too soon. Uh, no, because not the, end. Is not the real problem. The problem of the global economy that is staggering, whilst you've got a political system in the US imploding, you've yeah. got Brexit madness going on, you're falling apart, and yeah. you've got China playing silly buggers. We haven't got to the real nasty bit yet. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, it, it's very um, hard to see. Uh, are you having troubles there, Jessica? You, you're muted, by the way. No, I know. I just I want to know what the really nasty bit is. Who's going to tell me about the really oh, nasty bit? Well, so the thing is, it's like when you're in a massive tragedy situation, like when when nine eleven happened, it was kind of like, oh, what's this going to be? Oh, there could be a war. You know, there could be like no one knew that it was going to be like over a decade of constant war on terror, um, and like on that in during September, it, it felt really bad. It was really bad, but no one knew that it would be like trillions and trillions of US dollars poured into this and billions of Australian dollars as well poured into a war, which 20 years later has consequences for us. Like, you know, we're still talking about potential war crimes committed by our soldiers in that, that, that arena. Um, it's, we haven't, worked out what businesses are still going to exist in three months time. Um, we have been very lucky in this country in that we've only had, I think it's 94 deaths that we're up to right now. Um, that equates to around about three deaths per person in this country. Uh, sorry, three deaths per um, million. 1 million people. Um, in England, it's up around the 400 mark. And so, like, it could be a lot worse. Like, we could just lift the restrictions now and end up like the UK. Um, it, it, we haven't solved COVID, so we don't know where the end is. But the it's other issue, too, is COVID game. is not the pandemic that some of the epidemiology, the, 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 the pandemic study peoples have been doing. It's not the pandemic that Bill Gates has been talking about since 2014 on TED. He was talking about 30 million dead. When you get a 30 million death, the economic disaster that happens out of the back end of it is way beyond what we're seeing. 
what will get worse now is that you know basically as james said we don't know what business is global will be there last parts of the american fracking industry are going to disappear you've got a fight going between opec and russia on prices that won't go away we've got our lng industry at the moment uh it's not going to survive with the sort of prices that we're seeing so you'll see parts of the supply chain fall apart parts of the shipping system will fall apart you'll have a loss of credit in some areas we're already seeing that with trading oil so the economic ripples that we started with a very weak position nationally not with government debt, but with private debt. These ripples are going to go on, and we're not in a place that you can model because there's just so many complexities of what's happened. The nastiest bit is not what we're doing with the health system now, pandemic. The nastiest bit is potential, not just recession, but depression and global economic crisis that, ri- that bounces for a long time. That is long-term suffering for people where we're talking about out of work, you know, mass problems if you think back to the depression that's the thing that we've got to focus on coming the back of this we're going to have to actually work very hard to manage that just just in terms of uh what sort of a pandemic it is though i i mean yes bill gates was talking about 30 million dead and we aren't near that yet but we also aren't near that many infected yet now, when you look at the Australian numbers, you've got around about 1% of people who are just a little bit over 1% of people who are in, uh, diagnosed, not infected, because there's a difference between that. Um, mm-hmm. The number of people diagnosed, one, just over 1% of those people die in our country. Um, and that's with extraordinarily good healthcare. Um, even if you say there's a large number of people who are undiagnosed, let's say there are twice as many people who are undiagnosed. So only half a percent of the people who get it die. That's still going to be 37 million people dead across the world if we let this thing run. Um, and we don't have a cure for this. Like we we are hoping for a vaccine. It's um, It takes a long time to do vaccines. And the last time they tried to do this with SARS-1, the some of the vaccines that they were investigating were actually causing um, very strong illness in the animals that they were testing it in. So it gave uh, protection, but it was killing some of the animals that they were giving the vaccine to. <laughs> so it's like, if that happens for the COVID vaccines, we can't rely on vaccines. Like I, I think that there's so much overemphasis on. Don't worry, it's just going to be 18 months of you stuck in your room playing computer games, and then we'll go outside because we'll have a vaccine. We aren't doing well. Firstly, we haven't been doing enough vaccine research to achieve that. But secondly, even if we do, like it could just be the nature of the disease that we can't actually create a vaccine. My field was HIV. It's been 40 years of this infection spreading around the world and no vaccine. Um, Every single vaccine that they've tried has actually like resulted in more people getting HIV than um, not. So yeah, we have to think of what the the consequences are if we don't have a vaccine because we might not get there. Cheery thought, in about 12 weeks, the bushfire season will start again. So what we do with bushfires, we actually move people from interstate and overseas to help deal with it like we did last summer. <clears throat> I just start to think, and this is a discussion we've been having with people. There's people dealing with COVID. There's people dealing with bushfires. So the discussion we've been having behind the scenes with some of them is, let's put those two things together. What are you going to do in 12 weeks if the bushfires kick off? Are you just going to bring all these people from interstate or overseas? We've got to be thinking about this because it's going to be an even more complicated or complex problem. So there's a whole bunch of challenges that are really going to build on top of each other. Can I, just adding on to this, if, if we're talking about wanting to bring back the systems that we've had and the reality and going back to normal, we get, you know, this, it, to me, I look at this and I see all the wonderful things that the complex systems we have, these global systems and the challenges that they bring, like a, a pandemic, I don't know if you can have one without the other. And I think that's the really interesting thing here, that when you get periods of great um, global connection, you do get things like pandemics arising. And it's it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. And I think that's one of the dangers with, we can't have all the life we wanted to have if we don't have a pandemic. And I know that's sort of what James is saying. I think we need to have those sort of discussions with people 
because people are deeply emotionally invested in the reality of, of what they know. And people will do anything they want, anything they can to get back to what we know. And it is going to take a particular type of leader or a politician or group of politicians who can actually say to people, this isn't going away in 16, 16 months, 18 months. Um, and I worry about people that Jess deals with because we're all, I mean, I'm working, I'm assuming some of us are working. There's a hell of a lot of people who aren't. And they do not want to hear that this is going to go on for longer than 18 months because their, their career doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. I tell you what, a lot of the people who are currently working and working from home are relying heavily on the NBN. That yeah. we would be without that, you know. Can we have a happy thought, please? <laughs> You've come to the wrong panel. <laughs> because I'm doing a Monty Python always look on the bright side of life as we are being present. <laughs> okay. All together now, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Look, it's actually eight o'clock, and 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 that's not not that we're really on a strict time limit, but that sounds like a a reasonable sort of place to to um, wind this up. Um, I'd like to thank you all, Jesse. You maybe didn't get quite as good a shot as you should have. You got any sort of parting words you'd like to um, give us? You're on mute at the moment. You're on mute. You're muted. All I'd like to say is that um, this Sunday is Mother's Day. So do something really nice for a mum that you love. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bravo. Bravo. Okay. I'd like to thank you all, Jesse, Anthony, James, Sean, John, and um, our technical man, Hugh McDonald. And um, it's good night from me. And Good night from him. Now, for the rest of you members, you can roll the um, interval card, maybe, uh, Hugh. Um, we're going to have a short break for for a cup of coffee or something. And, uh, yeah, see you. Thank you all. That's really good. Thank you. And, thanks, uh, David. Thanks. Thanks for organising this, David. Much appreciated. Oh, look, yeah, no, thank you for inspiring it and, and being supportive. So, no, it was it was good. Really good. And we'll get together and have a coffee one day. In months, oh geez. Bye. Okay. So for your members, uh, well, you, anyone's allowed, you, you're all welcome to stick around, even if you're not a member, but um, we're going to have a little break. Then I've got to do my statutory president's report to the club, which is going to be short and sweet. And then we've got a what's new in technology and so, so on from George Scarbeck. So see you again in about 10 minutes. Okay, well, I hope you've all had a time to have a cup of tea or something. I've barely had time to just fetch myself a cup of tea, so here we go. Oh, hot. And uh, next item on the agenda is a very brief, and it's going to be a brief um, President's Report. As you probably can imagine, I've been fairly busy just organising this evening, so there's not a great deal else to report. What's more, I haven't had time to even think about preparing a report. Um, so I've been very focused on, on this um, program tonight and lining up all those speakers. Um, I have a few other ambitions, I, I'm going to call it, for, for things in the club. And George, who we'll be hearing from shortly, is going to help do a photo contest. Uh, got a couple of other things as well. Uh, lined up. I've lined up a discount for members on a little 3D printer that's sort of a kitty sized one but easy to use and support and a few few other things. So it's going to, that's almost the end of my short presence report. Um, there is the other matter that you are pro probably all aware of but we are on an open forum at the moment so um, we were unable to discuss that but the transition committee is working hard on your behalf to resolve and avoid some potential problems. So I think without further ado, um, we have George Scarbeck here already rearing to go with a what's new segment. So I'm going to hand over to George. All right. Uh, thank you, David. 
Um, can you hear me? Yep. All good. Okay. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit about little bit about what's new. Um, seeing as it's a computer club, um, I'll actually talk a little bit about computers. Um, Intel claims that they have re re released a new uh, laptop CPU that can go above the five gigahertz barrier. That might seem very impressive for a laptop. However, um, that's in uh, turbo mode. The average clock speed, I think, from memory is 2.2 gigahertz. So they're trying to get the headline news. Uh, but that announcement comes just over a few days that AMD blew away the reviewers with real world debut of the Ryzen 4000 laptop chips, uh, which strike a fantastic balance between power and, and efficiency and open the door for thin, light uh, laptops. Seeing it's all new, I had difficulty finding uh, good statistics on um, benchmarks, who managed to benchmark the latest um, Intel of AMD. And Intel is going for a single core, which seems a little bit strange. I know they have problem with their uh, fabrication plants, but on single core, it's about 3% better than the single core Ryzen. However, for most things like video rendering or sort of things you'll be using it, the AMD chips are about 25% faster. And the difference between the ninth generation, 10th generation in Intel isn't great, not much, uh, barely w worth lo looking at it. So don't rush out and buy something because it's the latest and the greatest. In my opinion, it's not much. The, there's been a lot going um, in the autonomous vehicle, a hell of a lot. I subscribe to a few um, technical subscriptions, but there's a new van powered by the NVIDIA's uh, autonomous computing platform. And the company says it's got an unprecedented 320 trillion, not million, not billion, trillion operations per second of deep learning. Um, there's a lot of technical stuff on, on the cores, GPU, the tensor cores, et cetera, et cetera. And it covers a full 360 degree field of view providing Multiple sensors, LiDAR, radar, cameras, global navigation systems, and internal navigation systems. Um, and they claim it's up to level four of self-driving systems. Level five is the ultimate. And for level five, you don't need a steering wheel or accelerator or brakes. So they're getting there. It's easier to claim, it'll be interesting to see how, how it actually performs. Um, I'm putting more solar panels on my roof. The people are coming tomorrow at about 8 a.m. But um, there's a new record being broken in efficiencies of getting very close to the 50% efficiency mark by a laboratory, 47.1%. Seems very impressive. And it's got a six junction, junction solar cell made up of six different uh, photoactive layers. Because most um, solar panels only look at the small fraction of the visible light. And they've managed to put in um, 100 layers of different elements into a solar cell that is single, thinner th than a human hair. 140 layers in, in that, so it can absorb energy over a spec wide spectrum. However, it was broken, the, light, the record was broken by a light, focused light to be 143 times stronger than natural sunlight. 
So don't rush out and order those for your rooftop. However, they tested a variation under the equivalent of the full sun, and it's still at about uh, nearly 40%. The average uh, solar panels that are being put up now are somewhere between 18, 19, some are getting close to 20%. What that means is um, for the same amount of um, uh, energy, you need less solar panels on the roof. If you've got a big roof, it doesn't matter what the efficiency is, you just, just put more of them. Now, I've been interested in GPS for many, many, very many years, and Australia and New Zealand commit to a satellite-based augmentation system for 2023. They'll be able to pinpoint any location on the Earth within 10 centimetres, 10 centimetres. And they claim it'll unlock more than seven and a half billion benefits in industry to both countries. Headline grabbing figure. Um, however, Scott Morrison and Jacinta Ardern, uh, New Zealand's prem Premier, is signed off on the, on the meetings and um, they expect to be operational. It's been been trialed uh, for 18 months and it'll be delivered probably in 2023 fully operational. Um, however, with the fantastic figures that they're claiming, um, an independent analysis by Erston Young found that improved um, technology, position technology, will deliver just over $6 billion in benefits to Australia and about 1.4 to New Zealand over 30 years, folks, 30 years. So much for the headlining, headline grabbing figures. Um, it'll improve uh, roads, rail system, much safer. It can improve the way farmers manage land, crop, livestock, and so forth. Um, now, I can see a few benefits for the average user with that sort of, um, Accuracy. Your GPS will know what side of the road you're on. And I encountered that a few years ago in the car. I was in a country winding road through the hills and came out in the T junction and I didn't really didn't know whether to go left or right. So I went left and then I put GPS take me home and it said do a U-turn if possible. Now it was a narrow road, but with that sort of accuracy. The, the system will know what side of the road you're on and immediately tell you which way to go. So it'll save you a few minutes um, to go around until you find somewhere you can do a U-turn. Still a long way short of $6 billion benefits, but every little bit helps. Now, on April the 29th, um, the Video Electronic Standards Association released a new version of display version to a display port uh, and it provides seamless interoperability with the new USB 4 specs published by the USB independent forum. What this will give you without going through all the technical stuff up to 80 gigabits per second 80 gigabits per second of data via a, a USB cable it can drive up to three 10K monitors. Okay, I haven't even got a 4K monitor. I've got a 3K monitor. It's, it's a 32 inch with a 4K. The writing to me is a little bit too small. Um, however, if you think you're going to plug it into your, something to the uh, USB 4, 80 gigabytes per second, gigabits per second, sounds very good. But you need something that can read something of that speed and write to that speed. So think about it. I, I have a floppy drive on one of my old computers. If I put the latest and the greatest uh, USB 4 card, well, I'd be able to write to my floppy at 80 gigabits per second. No, it'll be probably at 0 0.0001 gigabits per second because that's all a floppy can handle. It doesn't matter what you plug into. 
So yeah, for hooking up multiple monitors, it's good. I'm fairly sure it'll come here. It's supposed to arrive early next year. So when you buy a new computer, just ask, make sure it gets USB 4, because eventually in the lifetime of your computer, more and more stuff will be able to read data at that rate. Um, and that more or less winds it up. Um, just like to say that I've been reading in the last six or eight weeks, at least three articles by universities or other places that have improved or are improving the capacity of lithium ion batteries, which means they say can double it. it. Means your phone will go twice as long, your car will drive twice as far. And they're all using different approaches with elect, uh, with the athode or, or anode or cathode materials, other stuff mixing with lithium, other rare earth metals. So there's a lot of development going on, but they're all in the laboratory. Be interesting to see how many come into the field. And um, that's about it, folks. So over to you, David. I'll turn my microphone on. Thank you, George. Um, and I think that just about wraps it. I, I have nothing else for you. So I hope you've enjoyed your meeting. Uh, I will enjoy your feedback, whether it's uh, positive or uh, constructive criticism, shall we say. Um, you can go in on Yammer, on maybe on, um, or oh, what's the best group on Yammer? Maybe the monthly meeting live group on Yammer or just in chit chat. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. And with a bit of luck, and I doubt it's going to happen, we can be face to face. So until next time, it's goodbye for me and good night from Hugh, who did all the technical stuff. Thank you, Hugh. So good night. Thanks, David. Thanks, Hugh.